We're almost to the end of the season of Epiphany. Lent begins in about 10 days. But a few more stories, one today and one tomorrow, in the theme of Epiphany. A theme of what happens when the light goes on and people see Jesus in a new way. But today, it's not just seeing Jesus. Today, the story is also about seeing someone else. Seeing a woman whose story is told in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but each time they tell it differently. It's a well-known story about an unnamed woman who comes and anoints Jesus. In Mark's Gospel, as in Matthew's and John, this story comes just a few days before the crucifixion, and it has a particular meaning in that context. But Luke tells the story differently. He moves it further, he moves it up into the story of Jesus, into the story of what Jesus did and how he did it. And also, what was the response of people around him? And so let our hearts and our lives be open to the reading, hearing, and understanding of this ancient story. And let it offer us new life. May the light go on for us. Not only about who Jesus was and is, but also who this woman was and who we are. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the house of Simon, a religious leader, and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the leader's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the religious leader who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He, he replied, A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came on, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Susanna, 
and many others who provided for them out of their resources. Word of God, word of life. Let us be together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. And so we have come, O oh Lord, to this time and to this place, as the woman did with the whole of our lives. We have come to this time in which you would pour out your spirit upon us, pour out your love into us. And we pray that you will help us open our hearts, our souls, our minds to you once again. So that this ancient story that we may have heard before might be drenched in your spirit and in your love. And in that process, it might give us new life. That we might offer such life to this world. We pray in your name. Amen. One of the things I love most about the United Church of Santa Fe, and there are many, many things, I assure you, is that when this church, when you want to reach out to the wider world to help feed the hungry or house the homeless or advocate for the environment, you don't just write a check. You show up. You show up at the Interfaith Shelter. You show up at St. Elizabeth's or Casa Familia, you show up in public schools, you show up to clean up the river, you show up in a whole variety of different kinds of ways. You show up here in the life of the church, volunteering to mentor young teenagers or to bounce babies in the nurture center, ways of being able to see in a new way. For those of us who've never had children or those of us whose children are now bouncing their own babies, to be connected with young people in the life of this church is a way of opening our eyes. And so too are the ways in which you reach out and show up in other places. I was reminded of that dramatically this last Tuesday night when I had flown back from doing some interviews up at Pacific School of Religion, flew into Santa Fe and Betsy Bichelle picked me up. Because of the hour, we stopped at a local restaurant on Sirius Road to have a bite to eat before she took me back to the church to get my car. And as we walked into the restaurant, we were greeted by a young woman, probably in her late 20s, early 30s. As Betsy and I sat down and as the woman walked away from having given us the menus, Betsy leaned over to me and said, I think I know her. She just looked like any young person waiting tables in Santa Fe. She said, yes, I, I do know her. She had been a guest for a number of months at the Interfaith Shelter. And now she was working at this restaurant. So Betsy didn't say anything to her at the time. She was not the person who was actually serving us the meal. But as we were going out, Betsy went up to her and introduced herself and said, are you? And she called her by name. And the woman said, yes. And you're Betsy. And the woman and Betsy said, yes. And it turned out that, yes, indeed, the woman had been a guest at the Interfaith Shelter for almost a full year because she had lost her job. And through the shelter, she was able to get her feet back on the ground financially. She got another job. But then two months later, she showed up back at the shelter again. Because in that other job, she was being sexually harassed by two other employees. And the boss wasn't doing anything. So she felt she had no other option than to quit. She lost her apartment here in Santa Fe. And she moved back to the shelter. But with Betsy's help, and that of other volunteers and staff at the shelter, she got back on her feet once again. They decided they weren't going to bring charges against the business, but they wanted to make sure that any reference she had was still a good reference. And she found another job, and Betsy had lost touch with her because she no longer lived at the shelter. 
And she hadn't seen her in over a year until we walked into that restaurant. I guarantee you, because of that exchange last Tuesday night, I generally, you know, try to pay attention to who's serving food, who's a receptionist. I try to be friendly. But I guarantee you, I will not look at another weight person in this town in quite the same way. Because they all have their own stories, just like any of us, just like all of us. Simon, Jesus says to the religious leader, do you see this woman? Do you see this woman who has come into the feast? And that was not really an unusual thing at the time. Come into the feast, stood behind him weeping, and then kneeling at his feet and using her tears to wash those callous, dirty feet, breaking open a jar made of alabaster, not just of clay, and pouring a precious ointment over those feet, not just to rub them, but to anoint them, and then using her hair to wipe his feet dry. Simon, do you see this woman? And Simon has to say no. No. He hasn't seen her. All he's seen is a violation of his sensibilities. All he's seen is this woman going against the rules and regulations of her time. All he has seen is a sinful woman touching a holy man and the holy man not pushing her away. That's all Simon has seen, the travesty of it all and not her tears. Simon do you see this woman? And the fact is, for 2,000 years, Christians have really not seen this woman either. For one thing, we have conflated the identity of this unnamed, unknown woman in Luke's gospel and Mark's gospel and in the other gospels with that of Mary of Magdala. And if there's one place in the Bible where it says, no, I'm sorry, Dan Brown got it wrong, it is in these chapters because Luke ends chapter 7 talking about this unnamed, unknown woman. And he begins chapter 8 with the listing of Mary Ma of Magdala as the leader of a group of women who followed just like the male disciples did and provided for Jesus out of their means. Luke was a good writer. And good writers know you do not have somebody unnamed in one chapter and then name that same person in the next chapter. So the unnamed woman and Mary Magdala could not in God's good green earth be the same person. And if somebody quotes Dan, the Gospel of Dan Brown to you, please, please tell them that is balderdash and show them the Gospel of Luke. But we've also not known and we've not seen this woman for other reasons. Because she is consistently labeled as a prostitute. Because Luke identifies her as a, quote, sinful woman or as a sinner. But you know what? Luke also identifies, in fact, Simon Peter, the apostle self-identifies himself as, Lord, I am a sinful man, all the way through Luke's gospel and the other gospels. And Simon Peter has never once been labeled a prostitute. <laughs> Not once. There were all kinds of reasons why she might have been labeled as a, quote, sinful woman in the context that she was in. She might have been a midwife who in order to keep body and soul together and to feed children of her own, she might have had to deliver not only babies of her own tribe or of her own tradition, but Gentile babies. That would have been a sin in that context, in that time. She might have had to work on the Sabbath because that's when she could only find work. That would have been a sin in that context and in that time. She might have 
wanted to learn how to read. She might have questioned the elders of her faith. And that would have been a sin in that context, as it is in some Christian contexts still. The text does not tell us who she was or what her sins were. Simply that she was, quote, sinful, just like Simon Peter was sinful. But if you Google Luke chapter 7, <laughs> or if you Google sermons on this text, Nine times out of ten, the titles are going to be Jesus and the sinful woman, Jesus and the prostitute. Jesus heals the prostitute. Jesus helps the prostitute. It's not in the text. It's why biblical study is so important. You've got to know what you're reading, not what 2,000 years of history have said. All we know about the woman is that for whatever reasons, she was considered an outcast in her time and in her city. And for whatever reasons, she decided maybe she'd heard about this Jesus, maybe she'd seen him teach or heard him teach or seen him heal or just looked or saw that he reached out to other people like her who were somehow outside the fold. But she decided to show up and when she did, she started to weep. Started to weep. And we don't know why she did. I mean, why do you cry? <laughs> what brings you to tears? Was it a great loss? A great sadness? Was it tears of just sheer exhaustion? fear. We cry, we weep for all kinds of reasons. The text doesn't tell us why. But maybe she was weeping for joy. Maybe she was weeping for joy. That finally she was in the presence of someone who listened to her. Someone who saw her and not some label or some outcast. Why do you weep? What brings you to tears? And I wonder if, even though the text doesn't say it, whether or not Jesus wept too. To have someone care that much that they would take his feet into their hands, his dirty, calloused feet, and pour out precious ointment, and not just massage or rub them, but anoint them, and wipe them with her hair. Oh, my goodness. That would make me weep. To be that loved, that cared for. And the text doesn't say it either but I wonder if even old Simon didn't weep later on. Maybe later that night after all the guests had left, after he no longer had to be the leader or the right one, thinking back over that day and the passion of that moment and witnessing someone's love for someone else that much. I wonder if Simon wept, just like the woman. To be that loved, or even to have the opportunity to love that much. It's enough to bring me to tears. What brings you to tears? Yesterday morning, I was at the Roundhouse for a hearing on SB 489, the Transitional Energy Bill. Larry Rasmussen and I got there at 7.30 in the morning. It began at 9 and it lasted till, well, it lasted after we left, which was at 12.30. <laughs> Fortunately, it made it out of that particular committee. 
very important bill that would help New Mexico in a just and fair way transition from, its, from our dependence on oil and gas to more renewable energy, solar, wind, et cetera. A bill that is being supported by multiple environmental agencies and also by PNM and by the people most affected up in the San Juan Farmington area. Very complex bill. We had an hour and a half before they even began the testimony. I got a chance to testify, unfortunately Larry did not. But it was a good group, a good group. In that hour and a half as we were waiting, I started to struck up a conversation with a woman sitting next to me in, in the uh, hearing room, which was by that time packed. Turned out she was a lobbyist and advocate with the, um, with the Southwest Environmental Advocacy Group. And she was there not to speak, but to be there just in, in terms of her presence. She lives down in Albuquerque now, she said. But she grew up, she said, in Santa Fe. And I said, oh, what did your parents do here? And she said, her dad, maybe you knew him, um, was the superintendent for the public schools. I said, well, what was his name? She said, James Miller, Jim Miller. He was a much revered public superintendent in the 1970s and through the mid 80s. Man of incredible integrity and ethics. I didn't know him when he was first superintendent, but I got to know him a couple years later when the then superintendent of public schools in 1989-1990, Eddie Ortiz died very suddenly, devastating to the city of Santa Fe. And Jim was called back from retirement to be the interim here. For the, next, for the next two years. Just a really good, solid person. And Amy, his daughter, the person with whom I was speaking yesterday morning, said she had just given a speech and actually won a prize for a speech that she gave based on her father's life. It was a speech about leadership. I guess she joined, she's part of Toastmasters, and she'd won this prize down in Albuquerque. She was going to go to the regional. She was very proud of herself and proud of her dad about this sermon, this speech on, on, uh, on leadership. And she said, you know, my dad taught me all kinds of things about leadership. One of them was that he taught me about that leaders, that the humility of leadership. She said that her dad never, ever used a company car or a state car or a district car. He had bought, um, bought an auction, an old forest service truck that had smoky bear uh, Smokey Bear bumper stickers all over it, and that's what he drove around. That's what he drove the family around in, that's what they had to do, learn how to drive in, and that's what he drove to school meetings in. She said, as a teenager, I was mortified. I would sit in the front seat and I would hunker down so nobody could see me in this darn truck covered with Smokey Bear bumper stickers. But that was the kind of man she said her dad was. Humility was a trait of leadership for her. But she said the main core that I talked about was his integrity. He couldn't be bought, he couldn't be sold, he couldn't be sold, and he couldn't be bullied. And he always had to make hard decisions. After he left here as the interim in that period of time, he did interim superintendent jobs throughout the state. One of the cities he went to shortly after he got there, he found out that that the high school football team had been bullying high school, the high school girls, especially the cheerleaders, on the team bus. Not just bullying verbally, not just harassing, but in some instances actually sexually assaulting. And nobody had done anything about it. The coach knew about it. The principal of the school knew about it. Parents had gone to both of those people and told them what had happened to their daughters and nobody did anything. When Jim Miller found that out, he fired the coach and he fired the principal because it was the ethical and right thing to do. A week later, Amy said, her mom got a phone call from her dad at two o'clock in the morning saying he was on his way home, that he quit the job, never quit a job in his life. But they quit that job because they just had a school board meeting that night. And the school board had reinstated both the coach and the principal. And he said, I can't do this any longer. And so he left and drove home 
five hours. Got in, I don't know, early in the morning. Even though it had been a school night, both Amy's mother and Amy and her siblings had stayed up. Her dad came through the door, a beaten man. He came through the door and he burst into tears. She said that he, she had never, ever seen her father cry. And she seldom saw it ever again. But that night, he sat and he cried. And cried and cried. And they cried with him. You see, that school board and the coach and the principal didn't see those girls. They just saw that they were going to lose the championship football game. And that school board didn't see Jim Miller, person of incredible integrity. They just saw an interloper. Amy said, I'd never seen my dad cry, but I did that night. He cried because he was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to show how he cared and how that school needed to care too. He saw what needed to be done and he did it. What brings you to tears? What brings you to tears? Sometimes it's deep grief. Sometimes it's great loss. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's exhaustion. But sometimes it's also being in the presence of such integrity, such love, such care. We don't know why the woman was weeping. We just know that she was. Weeping so much that her tears drenched his feet. We don't know for sure that he wept, but how could you not, knowing such love? And maybe, just maybe, Simon wept too. Because that's what we do in the presence of being loved, of seeing love, of knowing love. So Jim Miller, his wife, his daughter, the whole family sat and wept. Thanks be to God.